Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malu Dumim in Israel. The expression, the buck stops here, was made famous by President Harry Truman. Apparently, it was a sign that Truman had on his desk that served as some sort of perpetual reminder that he and he alone was ultimately responsible for whatever he did as president. He couldn't pass the buck to someone else when he wasn't up for whatever task was upon him. It's clear that the phrase didn't originate with Truman, but it's equally clear that it would not be nearly as well known as it is had he not made it his signature saying. The phrase is fairly interesting. The word buck refers to a knife that was passed around the table in poker games to indicate whose turn it was to deal the cards. A person could pass the buck if they didn't want to deal. The opposite of this, the buck stops here, suggests that the person involved is ready and willing to take whatever responsibility has come their way. It has become a somewhat popular expression among politicians of all people. It is understood as a declaration of personal responsibility, although it frequently turns out to be nothing more than hot air. It is something that is extremely easy to say, but quite difficult to actually do. Words are cheap. But if somebody were to truly embody this expression, to really take on full responsibility for whatever whatever it is they are accepting responsibility for, that would indeed be impressive. This means no excuses, no blaming somebody else, no attributing failure to extenuating circumstances. It is not easy to imagine such a person in today's political atmosphere. Passing the buck and blaming anything but oneself is so routine and so expected that it is no longer considered such a terrible thing. It is not only in politics that this is the case. In almost every imaginable situation, the natural initial reaction to not living up to one's responsibilities is to find something to blame the failure on. In fact, it is difficult to say in today's world what would be looked upon with more disdain to accept the blame for one's failure or to blame it on someone or something else. While the first is more honorable, it does admit to the failure, which is a sure sign of heavy criticism coming down the line. The second method at least allows the person involved to squeak out of any blame since they are not accepting any blame to begin with. This skewed view of personal responsibility is, in my opinion, an indication of the warped values which have infected much of society in our day and age. Personal responsibility was always a hallmark of integrity and honor. If that is now looked upon as a negative to be avoided if possible, it doesn't bode well for the future. This week's Parsha is called Pinchas. This is another Parsha named after a person. Pinchas was somebody whose name came up in passing in the book of Exodus as one of the descendants of Aaron, the high priest. He is not mentioned again until the end of last week's Parsha when he has his moment of glory. This week's Parsha starts off with the follow-up of the events of, at the end of last, week, of last week's. Although his name only come up, comes up once in this Parsha, in the second verse, that is enough to grant him the rare honor of having a Parsha named after him. But it's to last week's, last week's Parsha that we have to go to understand what he did to deserve this honor. There was a fairly traumatic scene at the end of the Parsha following all the prophetic declarations of the prophet Bilaam. It seems that many of the Israelites allowed themselves to be seduced by the women of Moab. Why this abject sign of moral failure happened at this point is left unclear. Their failure was not limited to sexual matters, however. These women invited them to engage in the idolatrous practices of the Moabite nation, an absolute spiritual disaster for the Israelites of the Bible. But they fell for the trap and the catastrophe had to play out. God told Moshe to mobilize some sort of public display of God's wrath to quell the disaster. The leaders would be the ones to suffer consequences of this moral failure. But the plan never came to fruition because of some inability to act that struck those who could have dealt out this punishment. While all this was taking place, an Israelite brought a woman from Midian right smack into the middle of the encampment, right in front of Moshe and everybody else, to apparently engage in some blatant sexual relations. At this point, Pinchas enters the story. The key quote in the story goes as follows. Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron the high priest, arose from the assembly and took a spear in his hand. He followed after the Israelite man into the inner region, and he impaled both of them, the Israelite man and the woman, in their inner parts, 
and the affliction ceased among the Israelites. This was the only time the name of Pinchas is mentioned in the story. The Parsha concludes with the statement that a total of 24,000 people died as a result of this whole calamity. This week's Parsha begins, quote, God spoke to Moshe saying, Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron the priest, reversed my wrath from among the Israelites when I zealously took up the cause among them, and I didn't destroy the Israelites in my zeal. While late, he later became a somewhat major figure in the book of Joshua, his role in this story is over and he's only mentioned once more in the rest of the books of the Torah. But these two citations of his name were enough to assure him of inter eternal fame in Judaism. What did he do that was so great? It is true that he was the man of the hour in staving off the divine wrath over this serious breach of morality, but it is nothing really more than a passing incident. This sort of thing seems to happen every other week in the Book of Numbers. Even in the Parsha named after him, he is not a particularly significant figure. He saw what needed to be done and he did it. While there might be some who may look at his deed as the Torah's version of a vigilante killing, that is not how he has come down in Jewish tradition. He is looked upon as the classic hero, the person who rose up at the right moment to do what needed doing and what nobody else was willing to do. There is a certain traditional rabbinic backdrop to this whole story. It all comes from a strange phrase that is stated in the middle of everything. Moshe had asked the judges to handle the killing of the leaders of the sexual rebellion, but their apparent inaction gave this Israelite man the opportunity to do what he did that in turn resulted in Pinchas' heroism. That strange phrase states that, quote, they were crying in front of the tent of convocation. It is unclear in the text who exactly was crying and, wh crying and why. Some say it was all those involved who should have been taking charge, including Moshe. In other words, Moshe himself was paralyzed by this brazen impropriety and couldn't act. At that point, Pinchas entered the scene and reminded him of an obscure law that is not stated anywhere in the written text of the Bible. This law applied precisely to this very situation was happening right in front of everyone. The law allowed for a particularly zealous individual who was outraged by what was happening to take matters into his or her own hands and stop the incident in its tracks. In other words, this law allowed for vigilantism in this precise situation. Pinchas reminded Moshe of this obscure law. Moshe, instead of acting upon it, as we might expect, told Pinchas that, quote, the carrier of the message should deliver it. This rabbinic phrase means that the fine print of the law was that it was only that person who remembered that this was indeed the law who could actually carry out the deed. To be a genuine vigilante, one had to be moved by the moment. Anything else, in being reminded of the need to be a vigilante, was not sufficient. This additional rabbinic backdrop really clues us in on why Pinchas is considered such a hero. While he did the deed that stemmed off the brewing disaster, that was not all that he did. He also was the only one who was able to maintain a clear enough mind when everything was reaching a climax to know what precisely needed to be done. This fact alone is what qualified him for the status of the Torah's version of a vigilante. Anybody else, including Moshe, could not have risen to this moment for the reason that they didn't maintain the awareness that this was the proper thing to do. There was no message for Pinchas to deliver to anybody. The message was the act itself, which only he could do because only he, he remembered the message. There is an ironic subtext to all this that has some bearing on the idea of passing the buck and the buck stops here. Could we say that all those others who witnessed this whole thing and essentially sat back and did nothing passed the buck? The answer, perhaps surprisingly, is no. They really didn't know what to do. They were paralyzed with inaction. Perhaps their crying was a symptom of this paralysis in that they sensed that they weren't living up to their responsibilities but couldn't do anything about it. But it was their unawareness of what needed to be done that spared them the guilt of passing the buck. It was only Pinchas, the single person who was aware, who could claim the right to say, the buck stops here. 
It is not just anyone who can ascend to that level of responsibility. Only those who, are, who truly understand what needs to be done can also understand that it is incumbent upon them and them alone to do it. Knowledge is responsibility. Ignorance, as limiting and as, as ignorant as it is, can be a form of moral bliss. If one doesn't really get the needs of the hour, one cannot truly be responsible for implementing them. To be able to say the buck stops here and to live according to that claim is to truly know the situation. Pinchas, of all those people who were, witnessed that incident, was the only one who really got it. The others saw but somehow missed something essential. Moshe really told Pinchas when he reminded Moshe of that obscure law that the buck could only stop with Pinchas. Sometimes this is the way things have to be. We may only have a few opportunities in the course of our lives to play the role of a Pinchas. This may be because we simply rarely encounter such a situation, or it may be because we lack the awareness right at that moment of what needs to be done. But when the moment arises and we, when we find ourselves in the position to know what to do and that we alone have somehow been chosen to do it, we have to act. There can be no passing the buck when fate calls upon us to act. Shabbat Shalom.